I believe the best medical book that we have is the Bible. And in Psalm 119, verse 73, the psalmist says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. In other words, the great God of heaven made our bodies, he fashioned us, and he and he alone knows the conditions that our body needs. So what is the healing message from the Bible? In James chapter 5, verse 15, the Bible says, If any among you are sick, so this is the question we want to know. What do we do? If any among you are sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him and let them anoint him with oil. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Then the next verse says, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another for the effective, f fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In Ellen White's comments on this passage, she says, it is not enough to pray. She said, when you pray for the sick, the Lord brings to the mind a simple natural treatment that can be applied. In page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, I believe is the recipe for healing. It's got everything that we need. It starts by saying the only hope of better things is the education of the people in the right principles. Let the physicians teach the people that restorative power lies not in drugs, but in nature. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that arise because of a violation of the laws of health, which I have written up here. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. So the detective hat has to be put on. And that's why in Proverbs 26, verse 2, it says, The curse causeless shall not come. There is always a reason. Job 29, 16 says, The cause I knew not, I searched out. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. So the cause should be ascertained. Wrong habits corrected, unhealthful conditions changed, then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system because the body's designed to heal itself. Pure air, sunlight, abstemishness or, or temperance, rest, exercise, proper diet, use of water, trust in divine powers, these are the true remedies, they're the remedies. And when, you've, when you have a look at the cause, just go through the eight laws of health. And in the majority of cases, you will find, I find, that here you will find where the cause is. Sometimes people are doing everything right, but they're so stressed out, they're so worried, fear. And of course, God has said in first, sorry, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Trust in divine power is a very important part of health. In fact, Ellen White states in Mind Cure that nine tenths of all diseases have their source in the mind. So we need not to have fear. Remember, we need to have faith and faith goes strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt. Moving on in page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, it says all should become intelligent as to the human frame and how to keep it in the conditions necessary to do the work of the Lord. It is important both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and have a practical training that will enable one rightly to use this knowledge. And then it goes through the eight laws of health in that passage. And then it says, nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual. And to the impatient, it seems slow. And that's why at this stage, I give the verses, Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And then the, uh, the other verses, Hebrews 10, 
35, where it says, Cast not away therefore thy confidence in the which is great recompense of reward, for ye have need of patience, in that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall not have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back under perdition, but of them that believe in the saving of the soul. You see, the just shall live by faith. So remember, it takes a little time. And also in page 127 of the Ministry of Healing, it says, um, the, the use of natural remedies requires an amount of care and effort that many are not prepared to give. But in the end, it will be found that nature untrammeled does her work wisely and well. Those who persevere in obedience to her laws will reap the benefit in health of body and health of mind. So this goes beautifully hand in hand with what the Bible says. But unfortunately, many take for granted this running of the human body because the body bears long. And so in Psalm 119, verse 67, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. Many people don't think about the running of the human body and what to do when they get sick until they get sick. And so moving on a little bit more to verse 71, the psalmist says, It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And then to 73, the verse I opened with me, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments, the laws that govern the functioning of the human body. Every home should have an anatomy and physiology book because that's a book about us. And it talks about how our colon works, how our lungs work, how our stomach works. We need to have an understanding of that. And in Proverbs 14, verse 6, the Bible says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. It's important to understand the workings of these different organs and how they interact with each other so that we can have the knowledge on how to treatment, how to treat them. In the book Christ Objects Lessons, page 347. Ellen White says, transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. You see, God has written his law with his own finger on every nerve, every muscle, every faculty with which we have been entrusted. And any misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. All should become intelligent as to the human frame and how to keep it in the condition necessary to do the work of the Lord. She says in this passage that the relation that exists between the physical organism and the spiritual life is one of the most important branches of education. And I would like to add one of the most neglected. The physical organism should be carefully preserved and developed that through humanity, the divine nature might be revealed in all of its fullness. How often is God robbed as workers of workers because the physical organism has gone down. And everything that happens in the physical organism affects mentally. And everything that's happening mentally affects the physical organism. So it's a whole package. And that's why these eight laws of health are the true remedies. So it's important to understand these. It's important to go through these. And many years ago, when I first married my husband, Michael, 19 years ago, he was, the, he was the business manager at a health retreat in Australia. And I was a mother. At this stage, I had helped a few other mothers. I developed simple knit, little natural treatments to treat my children. Other mothers would ring me and I would advise and, and help them. I had a few books and I looked through the books and whatever they said, depending on what the problem was, I would do. That's how I, I taught myself the natural remedies. We lived in a rainforest, so we're a long way from anywhere. And I used to claim the promise in Psalm 32 verse 8, where God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. One of my biggest learning curbs was my son Peter. He was my fifth child. Um, 
it was a very interesting birth because um, they thought I had a long time to go, so I was left and I could feel the baby coming and I realised I had to deliver my baby myself. Now I'd had several home births and I, I'd seen how it was done and so I was, by the grace of God, praise God, I was able to deliver my baby. So he had a very natural birth. He was totally breastfed and as babies do, he got a cold and when he got the cold, this must have been about five, six months, he went into quite severe breathing distress, which really frightened me. And the little natural remedies that I developed on my other children, it, it, it didn't seem to be helping. I lived in a rainforest and my neighbour came over who worked in, um, in emergency and he saw Peter and he immediately was very, very concerned. And I said, oh no, he'll, he'll be all right. It took about two days and eventually the tightness of his chest eased. The next time it happened, he was about 10 months of age and it was very, very severe. And I did not know what to do, so I went to the hospital. They were very, very concerned at how, how hard it was for him to breathe and how severe his breathing distress was. With every breath, his nostrils would flare. With every breath, his muscles from his hips right up to his ears would just clamp. It was a very scary thing to watch. So they gave him a drug called Ventolin. It didn't seem to do very much, but you know, within about a day and a half, he eased a little bit and I took him home. And then I read an article where it said that Ventolin reduces breathing capacity. And I thought the very drug that Peter is being given to help with his breathing distress is weakening his lungs. So I went to a naturopath. I went to the naturopath because I said everything I usually do isn't helping. And he looked at Peter and he said, this is a very sick little boy. I said, oh no, he's not sick at the moment. But the naturopath could see that Peter was not well. By this stage, Peter's about 14 months of age. And I remember one, it was in an afternoon and he was very, very tight breathing distress. I was up in the rainforest, there was no cars. And my children were learning for their memory verse that week, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. So I gathered my children together. So Peter was maybe about 13 months at this stage. So my next child was two and a half, the next child four, the next child seven, the next child nine. And I said to them, children, I'd like you to lay your hands on Peter. He's, he's very sick and we're going to claim the promise. We're going to claim the promise of your memory verse that the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. We closed our eyes and we prayed to the great God of heaven to save our their little brother and my son. When we'd finished praying, it wasn't long after that, Peter still had the breathing distress that he fell asleep and he slept for two hours, first time he'd slept that long for days. And when he woke up, his breathing distress was gone. And I was thrilled that God had answered our prayer according to the promise. But Peter still had a weakness there. I had to do something and I didn't know quite what I had to do. And the naturopath, who I saw when he was 14 months of old, he gave me some clear guidelines. He said, absolutely no sugar. We, were, we weren't eating sugar, but no milk. We were still having a bit of cow's milk. Now my sister, my younger sister and my father both have asthma. So my son Peter got a genetic line there, but there were still some things that I could do and I needed to learn them. I discovered that Peter had severe physiological asthma. And so what I would do, I would um, do hot and cold treatments on his chest. Uh, I also found that if he had an enema, just when he got his breathing distress, that, that stopped breathing distress from 24 hours down to five hours. I would not give him anything but fruit to eat as soon as he got a cold and that, that would certainly help. I would give him slippery on with a little bit of licorice and that certainly helped. So our, through the natural treatments, we got his breathing distress down to, to only five hours. But it was still a very tough five hours. I can remember days where he would be 
having the breathing distress on my lap and I would just be crying. It's such a scary thing to see your child so sick. But every time he got a cold, the breathing distress got less and less. And then I was pregnant with my sixth baby and I was a little bit fearsome that what would happen if I'm in labour or with my baby and then Peter's in severe breathing distress. But you know, I resisted the temptation to fear. And I know that your faith grows strong by earnest conflict with fear and doubt. And so I had faith and believed that God would take me through whatever he called me to go through. Because we know it says in Corinthians that there hath no temptation taken you, but that which is common to man. But God is faithful and he will not, he will not put you anything through that you can't cope with. And with that temptation, he'll make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. It's a very good verse to, to claim. Peter never got severe breathing distress again. He got a cold. In fact, he had a cold when I went into labour with my sixth child, but it didn't go very severe. When Peter was three years old, the naturopath rang me. He said, Barbara, I'd like you to tell me everything you do with Peter because he said, Peter is the worst case that I have ever seen. And he said, you know more than me now on asthma. Can you see our learning curves? Our learning curves are going through these experiences. The naturopath said, I'm about to speak to the uh, Asthma Foundation. And he said, I would like to give them Peter's story. I was unable to speak because I was in the rainforest with a baby and many children all homeschooling. And I was very, very shy. I, I had never speak in, spoken in front of people before. So the naturopath spoke for me. He said the Asthma Foundation were quite resistant, but he said after a while they softened up and they listened to him. A lady came up to me, a lady came up to him at the end of the meeting and she, she said to me, she said to the naturopath, you've described my son James. She said, my son James is the same age as this boy that you're referring to. She said, my son James is seven now. He's been given two weeks to live. He has a glycerin enema every day and he is on cortisone suppositories and he's not given long to live. And the naturopath rang me up and he said, and look at Peter. And I thanked God for that experience because these conditions are scary, they're very real, but I quickly saw that medicine, even though their drugs might bring a little bit of relief, I learned very quickly, drugs do never cure disease. They just change the form and location of the disease. So we need to become intelligent as to the human frame. We need to find out how the body works and we need to find out the conditions to apply. Praise God, there are so many good books out there that, sh that show the simple natural treatments. That's why in page 127, she says it's important to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and have a practical training to enable one rightly to use this knowledge. And I found a book that had Dr. Kellogg's water cures in it. And so I started to do things like that. And I found that the water treatments were very, very powerful. It was the hot and cold compresses on Peter's chest that gave him some relief with his breathing distress. And it certainly was the enema also relieved with the breathing distress. In, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we have another verse that tells us about the health of the body. And in that section, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Notice it's by God's mercies that we do that, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. A living sacrifice. How do we present this living sacrifice? The living sacrifice must be a body that works. It must be a body that is not sick. <laughs> And if it is sick, if you give it the right conditions, it will heal. And my, I look at my son Peter today, who's got very big shoulders, who's got very big muscly arms. He is 30 now and he owns 
Actually, he's 31 and he owns a tiling business and he has 20 men working for him. He's very, very successful and he's got a very strong, fit body. And yet, I know that there are three instances where I nearly lost Peter. But given the right conditions and under the guidance of God, Peter became strong. So you can turn a weakness in your body to a strength, which is what we were able to do with Peter. So the Bible says, present your body's living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The reason why it says reasonable, because we are the winners. Because you see, we are the ones that are living in this body and it's not a happy thing to live in a body that doesn't work. And then the Bible further explains. It says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to the way this world dresses, to the way this world treats sickness, to the way this world vaccinates poor defenseless babies, causing so many neurological problems in babies. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And this is to everyone around us. You see, the best way you can teach others about natural healing is basically to do it in your own life. What is the saying? Preach the word and sometimes use words because your life is your biggest illustration. I had many people come to me when I was in the rainforest asking for help purely because they saw the children. Sometimes they'd see the children wrapped up in bandages and they'd say, what are you doing? Oh, well, I've got garlic on there and we've put a bit of charcoal on there. I never pushed it onto anyone, but they would watch what I was doing and they would inquire. You see, in Hebrews 12 verse 1, it says, Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. You see, the witnesses are our family, the witnesses are our neighbours, the witnesses are our relatives, the witnesses are our workmates. Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and run with race with patience, the race that is set before us. Notice how patient is needed because it's not always easy. The race set before us and everyone can win in this race. Looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Wherefore consider him who endured such contradiction against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. Can you see that message coming through again? A little bit of patience is needed because these things don't happen overnight. They're not quick and many people don't want to use the natural remedies because they take an amount of care and effort that many are not prepared to give. You see, nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual and to the impatient it seems slow. The other verses in the Bible that talk specifically about health are 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. It says, no, you're not, that your body is the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. God doesn't often have, he doesn't often have to destroy because we destroy ourselves. <laughs> Some people say, well, I don't drink alcohol and I don't drink cigarettes. Yes, but you're dehydrated. You're having late nights. You're not eating enough greens. You're not eating enough salads. You're going to bed too late. You can defile the body, and you do when you break these laws. No wonder further on in 1 Corinthians 3.19, the writer says with an exclamation mark now, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. You have no right to put alcohol in your body. You have no right to have a late night. You have no right to be dehydrated. You have no right to put stimulants in your body. You were bought with a price. And we know what that price is. You were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. So you have no right. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. One lady 
was about to work at our health retreat and she said, but I actually really want to eat what I want. And Marcus said, well, this is not the job for you. <laughs> when you're in a health retreat, you're in a glass bowl there because the guests want to see, they want to see that you do this. And if you don't do it, what are you saying? Ah, oh, it doesn't really work. You have to be a living example of how this works. And that's why the Bible says it is your reasonable service. It's a very reasonable service because the body that you're living in now works. I'm going to give you a few examples now of how these simple treatments have profound effects. I was in New Zealand and I was talking to a lady who wanted to ask me a few questions and she brought her little boy with her. He was seven. And I immediately saw his finger. It was twice the size. It was all red and it had like a, a white sealed top on it. And I said, aha, what's the matter with that finger? She said, well, I've been to the doctor and it's cellulitis. You know what cellulitis is? Inflammation of the cell. Well, that's not rocket science, is it? We've got inflammation of the cell. I said, aha, uh -huh. what are you doing? She said, well, we're into our second week now and we're on our second course of antibiotics. I tell you, that finger didn't look very good. And we're in our second course of antibiotics. And she said, he's on painkillers every night and sleeping tablets because he can't sleep. He's seven. And what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results. That's why you have to have an ear and an eye to the voices that are coming out of your body and other people's bodies. They will guide you. Obviously, this is not working. I said, um, do you mind if I try something? She said, please. So I got two cups. And one, I put hot water in it. Now the hot water was as hot as he could stand. I got him to put his good finger in to feel it because you've got to work with the will. Because remember, a man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. You've got to work with the will of the person. You've got to convince them. I said, put your good finger in. Does that feel good? He nodded. I said, put your sore finger in. He went, oh. I said, yes, just keep putting it in. If it's still too hot, we'll put a little cold in because that finger will be in the hot for three minutes and then it will be in the cold. And ideally the cold has a few ice cubes in it and the hot is as hot as, hot as the person can stand. I always put my finger in, I get them to put their good finger in and then you, you feel it there and the cold is 30 seconds, and there's a reason for this. You see, initially, the hot stimulates. It's like when you cold and you get into a hot bath, you can feel the stimulation, because when the hot water touches the skin, it causes the blood to rush to the skin and start moving. But it's not long, it's actually only three minutes before we get a slowing down or a depression. So the stimulating part of hot is three minutes. And then after three minutes, then it's depression or slowing down. So before it's got time to slow down, then we put the finger into the cold cup. We used a cup because that's all you need for a finger. And it had ice in it, 30 seconds, because cold initially is also stimulating. You see, we're warm-blooded creatures. And when cold touches us, <gasps> there's a reaction. And the reason there's a reaction is because we're warm-blooded creatures. And when cold touches us, the body says, oh no, cold's coming, move fast. But it only takes 30 seconds before depression happens. So we only have the finger in the cold water for 30 seconds. That's why so many died when the Titanic went down. Their whole body just stopped, just stopped because they were in ice cold water. But initially, when the water touched them, oh, there's a reaction, but only for 30 seconds, then depression hits in. So what we do then is we go back to the hot. And while the finger's in the cold, you have boiling water and you just put a little bit of boiling water in the hot bit. I always put my finger in to test, get them to put their good finger in. But after his finger's been in the ice cold, he can bear a little bit more hot. This is done three times. 
So hot water for three minutes, cold for 30 seconds, then back into the hot, back into the cold, back into those, three times. So how long did that take? 15 seconds, sorry, minutes, <laughs> 15 minutes at the very most. By the time he had his last cold, a big smile came to his face. He had received in that 12, 15 minutes more relief than his painkillers. Isn't that incredible? What did we do? You see, in an injury, the, the blood tends to sit and pool in an area. And what we need to do is get old blood out and fresh blood in. And that's what this hydrotherapy treatment does. Because of the stimulating effect of the hot, more blood is drawn into the area, pushing the old blood out. Before depression can happen, over to the cold. More fresh blood. And when the fresh blood comes in, the old bread comes out. What does the fresh blood have? You see, the blood is the healer because blood contains oxygen. Blood contains nu nutrients. Blood contains water. And blood carries away waste. Blood also contains something else, and that is your white blood cells. And your white blood cells basically are your internal army. Your white blood cells are designed to eat up and kill off any microbes that are in the blood. All we need is blood. The blood is the healer. That's why it's so important to be drinking your water, not have anything that will harm it, going to bed early, keeping those eight laws of health will result in pure blood because it is the blood that heals. So this is what we did with this little boy. And by the end, he had a big smile on his face. His pain levels had reduced right down. Now that's quicker than taking a Panadol. How long does a Panadol take to kick in? Ibuprofen, Nurofen's, aspirins. They take about 20 minutes, half an hour. Well, this is quicker. And no side effects, no harm on the kidneys, no harm on the liver, no brain bleeds, which is what the aspirin's causing. And I said, can I do a bit more? Well, the mother and the son were saying anything. <laughs> I grated up a potato and I made a little package and I wrapped it around his finger. I put a little bit of plastic on it and then I taped it on. And then I asked if I could pray for this, because remember, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Do you remember Ellen White's comments? Praying is not enough and natural treatments are not enough. We've got to bring them together. We've got to marry them, the natural treatments and the prayer. And I asked God if he would please bless this treatment. That's all you have to do, just a simple little prayer, because he made he made the potato, he made the herbs, and so he uses those. And so we prayed for it, and she said, what will we do now? I said, well, maybe in a couple of hours, do it again, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and then do it again just before he goes to bed, and then do it again in the morning, and we'll see what's happening about then. Well, as soon as they got home, the little boy said to the mother, can we do that again? You see, that little boy had experienced the relief that he got from the simple natural treatments. The mother got back to me and when, they, when he woke up in the morning, so that would have been the third poultice, everything came out. The whole wound had opened, all the blood and the pus came out and the finger was back to normal. I, she said, what will I do now? I said, just cover it, that will slowly heal. That will, that will certainly heal by itself. No matter how big the hole, if the body made the hole, the body can heal up the hole. No need for antibiotics, no need for painkillers, no need for painkillers. We did painkillers and no need for sleeping tablets. That first night after we did the hot and cold, so that little boy had them three times that day, he slept soundly that night. You see, most pain is due to inflammation. And if you can get the inflammation down by the alternating hot and colds, and if you can get the inflammation down with the poultices, then, then there is no pain. There is no need for the painkillers. About 40 years ago, I worked as a psychiatric nurse. 
And the last 18 months that I worked as a nurse, I worked in the operating theatre and I was the instrument nurse. So my role was to memorise all the instruments. I had to know where they all were so that in an operating theatre, the doctor's operating and he says, ah, oh, we need McGill's and it's not there. So they look at me and I had to be quick. I would go in, I knew exactly where it was. I would open the paper. I had the tongs that had the sterile ends. I could pick it up and I could have it in the doctor's hands in minutes. That's what I had to do. Sometimes a life depended on my speed. I was the instrument nurse. Let's fast forward uh, 25 years later. We're down at Mountain View Health Retreat, which was in Melbourne, and Michael and I are running our health programs, and we had a cleaning lady named Katie. Now, Katie was a very, very good cleaning lady. She loved cleaning. She'd be down on her hands and knees, and she wanted to get to work quicker, so my son, William, who was 14, was teaching her how to ride a motorbike. She was riding the motorbike and she thought she was going too fast, so she moved the handles back. And if you know motorbikes, that actually goes faster. A brick wall was coming, she turned it and over she went. William ran to her and her leg was broken. Now the bone was up, wasn't through the skin, but it was poking right up. Now we had a worker at the time named Male Bone Lang from Malaysia, and his grandfather was a bone expert. So Male Bone knew a bit about bones. He ran up to her, he was there, he said, hold your breath, Katie. And he just quickly moved it. She yelled out, but he had it in place. Then the ambulance came and they, they wrapped it up, I think in like a little blow up balloon to keep it there. Katie was in hospital for two weeks. They wanted to do a pin and plate, but every time they took her into surgery, they said, it's too swollen, we can't do it. I was visiting her and I had one of our massage girls and she was massaging gently her leg and we got the blood back into the leg and she was feeling much better with the massage. Her husband was across from me and he said, I think I'm just going to take Katie home. I said, do it. Now this was a real step in faith. She had broken her tibia, her fibula, and she'd crushed her knee. We saw the break in the, in the bone coming out. Well, I didn't see it, it was related to me, and the x-ray proved it. But we were getting nowhere in hospital. A Couple of times she was vomiting with overdose from morphine. She was having a terrible time. So we put her into my lounge room and we had her in the bed for three weeks. And she had her leg in like a brace that we could open and it was winter time so I graded up comfrey. In the winter all the healing properties go into the root and in the summer all the healing properties go into the leaves. It was winter. So I got my boys to go out digging and they certainly bought me bags of comfrey. I grated the comfrey, put it into a little package and then put it on her knee and we put our hands on it and prayed that God would bless this. We were certainly stepping out in faith. This was quite serious and we really didn't know what we was doing, but we knew that God knew and we knew that the hospital really wasn't offering anything. They said to her they'd have to do pin and plates and they said she would probably never walk properly again. There's quite possibly in the operation, some of the nerves might be cut. The, the prognosis was not good. So we thought, well, Let's try this. So after three weeks, um, we're able to get her out of bread. But the, the story I want to tell you is after, was probably a week and a half of her being in the bed, I came out one morning and I always sat in the lounge to read. And when I came out, she said, Barbara, Barbara, something happened last night. I said, oh? She said, there was all this movement in my leg. She said, it didn't hurt. It's as if something was going on in my leg. She said, I'm very excited about it. I don't know what it was, but I felt it. I said, really, that's very interesting. And then I sat down and I was reading the Ministry of Healing and I got to page 300, I think it's 316. And this is exactly what I read. God is constantly in upholding and using as his servants the things that he has made. He works through the laws of nature, using them as his instruments. They're not self-acting. I read that minutes after Katie had told me that. I said, Katie, listen to this. Do you know God's timing is perfect? 
And that verse told me and Katie that that night God was doing an operation on her legs through that, through that comfrey. No wonder I memorized it. God is constantly up, up employing and using as his servants the things that he has made. He works through the laws of nature, using them as his instruments. So I used to be instrument nurse. I am instrument nurse again. And the instruments I now use are hot and coals, are the herbs. And Psalm 104 verse 14, God said he gave herbs for the service of men, to serve us. And they do. That was very exciting to see that. After three weeks, we got Katie on crutches. After six weeks, we got her a walking frame because she was starting to hold a weight. After another two months, she was walking a lot more, hardly using the walking frame. After three months, she was walking. In fact, at our health retreat, we'd say, Katie, show everyone how you can run. This lady was in her 50s. She'd run up and down the corridor. No pain, no marks totally healed. That was such a learning curve for us. She went back to the doctor. She had an x-ray. He shook his head. He said, it must never have been broken. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Do you know, God is just waiting to do things for us that we can't even imagine if we will just step out in faith. Now, a lady rang me one day and she said, my daughter's trod on a rusty nail. Now, I've helped many rusty nails, hot and coals and grated potato. She said, we've seen your lecture on YouTube on poultices and we've got grated potato on it and the nail nearly came through the top of the foot and it was very rusty. She said, my daughter's 10, the, the foot's a little bit sore and it's still a little bit swollen, but we've got the grated potato on it. And I said, hmm, I think you should take the potato off and do some hot and cold foot baths and then put a fresh potato poultice on. I said, ring me in two hours. She rang me in two hours. She said, there is no pain, there is no swelling and, and my daughter is not complaining anymore. Can you see how the body will tell you? If she'd rang me and told me in two hours, no, it's actually getting worse, I would have said, well, just go to hospital. It's also very difficult for me from a distance. What I do is I say, try this. Try that. Try this and tell me what happens. And if there's a response, the body's basically saying, yes, we can do that. And I have to tell you that I've actually never had to go to hospital because the body always responds. I had a man ring me. This man has done our program. This man is 440 pounds. He's a very big man. He comes to the program and then he doesn't do it. So he's got a very big leg, he's a very big man. He sent me a photograph and this photograph was four weeks ago of a blister. And the blister was that big. I spoke to a friend of mine who's a doctor. I said, blisters and diabetics, she said, very common. It's because their circulation isn't good. This man won't exercise and he keeps going back on the bad food and he's worried. Then the blister bursts and now the whole thing is raw. And he sent me a photograph and there are big white pussy bits. There was raw bits. You're probably very glad I don't have the photo. It wasn't very pretty. It wasn't very pretty. And he knew that if he went to the doctor, they'd put him on antibiotic drips. They'd... He said, what can I do? And I said, number one, I said, you have got to stop all grain, all sugars, all fruit. You see, we've got to get this man some good blood. I said, you've got to drink two to three litres of water a day. You can have lots of vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, but until this heals, I want you on a very strict diet. I said, it would be a good idea if you went on one or two days of fasting a week and had juices. I said, I want you to swim. He is so big, he breaks the exercise equipment. I said, but you've got to swim in the sea. You see, the sea water is healing because of all the minerals. And it's called an isotonic solution. It has the exact same mineral balance and proportion as is found in our body. He emailed me back. He said, 
can I just go to the Olympic swimming pool? I wrote back and I said, the Olympic swimming pool will cause your leg to get worse. I said, but the seawater will heal your leg. I said, no, you've got to go to the sea. Now it's summer in Australia and he lives near the beach. And this was the best exercise that I could think of because this man has to move because the life of the flesh is in the blood. He's got to move that blood. Exercise moves the blood. He's got to have peak nutrition so the blood can heal it. I said, I want you to get some bottles of seawater and three or four times a day, you're to pour the seawater over that raw flesh. I said, and any parts that are looking a bit pussy, I said, clean it up with hydrogen peroxide, then the seawater, and then put it in the sun. He's got fairly dark skin for a, a white Aussie, so he could bear the sun. And I said, and at night, I want you to lay strips of aloe vera over the wound. You see, aloe vera has a growth stimulant, and it stimulates rapid healing. Every day this man is sending me pictures and every day it started to go smaller and smaller. So here we are. I think I got my last picture about a week ago. He's actually had our health retreat at the moment and the wound had totally healed. That's all pink flesh and there was one tiny little wound still healing. Isn't that remarkable? Did, did he go on any magical cures? No, no, no. The human body is the only thing with the ability to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Remember, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I might learn thy commandments. This man learnt through this. In fact, you could apply this verse to him. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I have kept thy word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. It's all, all found in Psalm 119. That was a real wake-up call for him because if that pussiness had continued with his diabetes, with his lack of circulation, they could possibly have taken his foot. That could possibly have spread. And yet how simple is that? Seawater, if it's a little bit mucky, hydrogen peroxide, aloe vera strips overnight, Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. I love being the instrument nurse. I love using God's ways to bring about healing. It's quite exciting. Do you remember what I said to you in page 127 of the Ministry of Healing? It is important both to understand the principles involved in the treatment of the sick and have a practical training that will enable one rightly to use this knowledge. You don't have to spend a fortune and do courses, buy the books and start doing it on yourself, on your family. This is what I did to my children and I've got some good news, they're all still alive. <laughs> they didn't suffer. But if I hadn't had a response, if I was at all concerned, I would go and see the doctor. And I, I remember I did it once when my first daughter was only little and the doctor said, she's got an infection, take this antibiotic and sent me home. And I thought, no, I, I believe the body can heal itself. And so I did fomentations to a chest. I learned about charcoal poultices on the chest. I learned about chopped up onion on the bottom of the feet. I learned about all of these things. And that daughter is now 40 and that daughter is now helping other people. You see, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which seems to so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. And in 1 Corinthians 9, 23, 24, it talks about the race. It says, Know you not that they that run in the race run all, and one receives the prize? Therefore so run that ye may receive. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. That's why temperance is a very important part of health. That's why page 127 of the Ministry of Healing says, Wrong habits... Um, yeah, unhelpful conditions change, wrong habits corrected because often there are some bad habits, like with this guy here. <laughs> he didn't get to 420 pound by eating good food. He got there by eating bad food. 
the sin which doth so easily beset us, and run with patience the race set before us. Every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We an incorruptible. It's referring to the games, the Olympic Games. And by the way, have you had a look at the sort of program they go through? And yet only one will win. I therefore so run, but not as uncertainly. So fight I, but not as one that beats the air. I keep under my body. I bring it into subjection. If by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to sacrifice. It's time to commit our bodies to the great God of heaven who bought it with an infinite price. It's start to look after our bodies. It's time to start looking after our bodies. It's time to start looking into natural treatments. It's time to start learning so that we can help others. For that is God's plan. Because many doors that would be slammed in our face if we were coal portering, they will open and invite us in to, so that we can help with their sickness. <laughs>